Hey fourth graders, Mr. B back again with more of the case of the deadly desperados. And yes, Lucy is with me and Thomas is up here too running around. I've been kind of crazy today. I'm not really sure. I don't I think the story is unsettling them. They're worried about PK. Now, I'm worried about PK too, and you might be, because when last we were reading, PK had been chased by Walt and his pards. And he, PK had gone into the Mexican mine and then gone deeper and deeper into the mine. It was the last place in the earth PK wanted to go. It was like going down into the fiery pit of hell itself, it says on page 228 in my version, because we stopped mid-chapter or mid-ledger. But only a stretch of tunnel and that ladder separated me from Walt, and I knew I had to go down. At least I didn't have to clamp the candle between my teeth, but as I went down and down, I felt as if I was in one of those nightmares where you fall real slow. All around me was a framework of wood, and though I knew the timbers were thick, it seemed they were only toothpicks holding up a whole mountain. After maybe 15 minutes of dizzy descent, I finally reached solid ground. I was amazed to see a whole city down here. There were picks and axes, and a small sawmill and lanterns. I also saw wheelbarrows half full of ore, ready to take their loads to buckets attached to windlasses and ropes and pulleys. I realized on, my, I realized on any other day this place would be swarming with miners. As it was, it was swarming with rats. Rats make good eating if you're desperate, but there were too many of them down here for my liking. When they saw my light, they melted into the shadows, but I knew they were there. I could see their beady red eyes glinting at me. As I went closer to the rock wall, I saw what must be the mother load, the Comstock ledge, Van the vanilla frosting in the cake of Mount Davidson. In the light of my candle, it was sparkling quartz all veined with blue, like the marble pillars at the International Hotel. I knew those blue veins were silver and that they would have to be pounded and sieved and amalgamated and refined, but it was silver and it was thick. It was what drove men and women mad. Suddenly I was dizzy and panting for breath. The blanket tied round my neck was choking me. I untied it and retied it more loosely and soon felt a little better. I wondered if anybody ever smothered down here. Then I held up my candle and went all around the wall rock. I heard the rats scuttling and squeaking, but they kept out of sight. I'd been looking for a good place to hide for maybe ten minutes when I felt a hot, damp draft on my face. I was about to offer up a silent prayer of thanks for a breeze, even a hot one, when without a warning the candle in my hand was snuffed out and I was plunged into darkness, darker than the inside of a black steer on a moonless night. Ledger Sheet 41 I was 200 feet below ground, in a rat-infested mine, and it was darker than a tar pit at midnight. Then I remembered that at Almax Oyster and Liquor Saloon, some people had tossed matches in my begging cup as a cruel joke. I started fishing around in my pocket. That was when I realized I did not have my seven shooter. I went cold all over. I remembered I'd put it down at the mouth of the mine tunnel so I could light a candle, a candle that had just been extinguished. I could picture my seven shooter lying there, right where I left it. I was without light and without the protection of a firearm. If there was ever a time to pray, it was then. I said, Oh Lord, please help me. I took a deep breath and dug my fingers deep into my right hand pocket where I put the matches. I felt a small hole and I realized most of the matches must have fallen out. Please Lord, I prayed. At last, my fingers encountered half a match down one corner of my pocket. I felt it all over, and my heart sank. It was the wrong half. 
I could hear the rats scuttling closer to me in the darkness as I dug deeper in my pocket. Finally, right down in the bottom of my pocket, stuck between two stitches, was the sparkable half of the match. That half match was the only chance I had of illuminating the darkness. I carefully pulled it out of my pocket, then, holding the candle in my left hand and the match in my right, I tried to strike it against the damp rock face. The first time I tried, nothing happened. I could hear the rats coming closer. The second time I tried to strike it, nothing happened. I felt a rat run over my moccasin. Finally, on the third try, the half match flamed up. I brought the flame to the candle's wick, but my hands were shaking so bad, I feared I would not get them to meet. Just as the match flame was beginning to burn my fingers, the wick of the candle caught, flickered, steadied, and burned bright. The rats scuttled away, and I breathed a sigh of relief so great that it almost blew out the candle again. I carefully cupped my hand around the flame to protect it. Then I moved forward. I felt the hot, damp draft again, the one that had blown out my candle. It was coming up from a tunnel in one of the bluest parts of the rock face. Cherishing my flame, I carefully started down this dark passageway. There were some picks and hammers beside the walls of the tunnel, which were shored up with timbers like a row of sash window frames stretching away into the earth. The tunnel went down a gentle grade for maybe a quarter mile. Every so often I caught the faint scent of alkali water. Ma Evangeline once told me there were 2,000 foot shafts in some of the mines of the Comstock. The damp got damper and the heat got hotter and at last I came into a clammy chamber about 12 foot by 12. Here the tunnel ended and here the scent of alkali was strongest. That might be alkali, but I'll call it alkali because that's what I've been calling it. I wondered where the smell was coming from, so I held up my candle, being careful to protect it with my hand. Its yellow light showed several objects in the cave. A wooden crate, four wooden buckets, three of them upturned, a coffee pot, empty tin cans, small ones, not the big oyster cans, a shovel, pickaxe, and hammer leaning up against one wall, an empty bottle of whiskey. I took a cautious step forward and almost tripped over a little wooden sign stuck in the ground. It read, Danger. I felt sick and dizzy when I saw what lay beyond it, a gaping black hole about six feet wide that seemed to me the very mouth of Satan. Ledger Sheet 42 I went cautiously to the lip of the pit and looked down. It was so deep that I could not see the bottom. I caught a whiff of alkali... Of alkali. Uh, I caught a whiff of alkali, and I remembered that Ma Evangeline had also told me that some shafts dropped down to rivers of boiling water running through the mountain. This is why it is so hot down here. There is a river of boiling water running beneath Virginia City. A sudden moist gust from the shaft almost blew out my candle again, so I lit a second one from the first and held them both close to my body, sheltering them from any disaster. Then, carefully avoiding the bottomless pit, I went to investigate the crate in the corner. It had words stamped on the side, N.B. Jacobs Fine Old Corn Whiskey, San Francisco, Cal. Bringing my candles closer, I could see the crate was half full of unopened whiskey bottles. On top of the crate lay three half-burnt candles, a pack of cards, a piece of moldy cheese, and some blank pages of a ledger book, all swollen with steam from the pit. There were also some matches. Matches! Hallelujah! I put some in my medicine bag so I would not be plunged into darkness again. Beside the crate, were the three upturned buckets, one of which I am using to sit on as I write. 
I figured some of the miners came in here to have a whiskey and a snack and play poker for matches. It was their own miniature subterranean saloon. I couldn't explain the pages from the ledger book. Maybe they used them to keep a tally while they were playing cards. It's not drafty here in the corner, only at the mouth of the cave. So I dripped a bit of wax on the wooden lid of the crate and stuck one of my burning candles there. Then I took the other candle and continued investigating this cave. There was a fourth bucket over by the pit. My nose told me it had been used as a latrine bucket. Presumably the men who came here used it and then emptied it out into the pit. One good thing about the dank hot cave is that the rats do not seem to like it. I put the coffee pot under a drip from the stony ceiling. I get about an inch of water an hour. It is that poisonous mixture of arsenic, plumbago, and copperas Bell warned me about. But I'm going to be dead soon, so I reckon it don't matter. <coughs> I got hungry a while ago, so I took my medicine bag to get so I took out my medicine bag to get my Indian Ma's flint knife and cut the mold off the cheese and ate it. I soon got hungry again and ate the moldy bit. I could now eat wang leather with gusto. Short Sally's funeral must be long over because I have felt the throbbing of the quartz stamp mills up on the surface and the occasional jarring thud of someone blasting with black powder somewhere in the mountain. But the miners have not come back down here. Where could they be? In a town where men work around the clock, this place has been empty for what seems like days. There can be only one explanation. Walt and his pards have somehow stopped the miners from coming down until they can find and kill me. I am hot and damp. I am hungry and I am tired. I am almost out of candles. But at least I have finished this account. I am so tired I can hardly see straight, so I am going to lie down and have a little rest. But let the final words of this account be a prayer. Lord, forgive me for all the things I did wrong in this life. Please bless all those who were kind to me in Satan's playground, and please may Jace not be dead. Lord. Grant that I may see you walking on the streets of glory, and please may my foster ma and pa and my Indian ma be there too. Amen. Ledger Sheet 43 Well, you probably guessed that I didn't die down there in the deepest shaft of the Mexican mine, because there are some more sheets with writing on them. You can also see that the writing is neater and less smudgy than what, what I wrote when I was down the mine. That is because I am now writing this at a small table overlooking the 100 mile view in my new lodgings on B Street. It used to be the back room for Bloomfield's Tobacco Emporium. It smells strongly of tobacco and is pretty bare, but it does have that window. I have put in a camp bed and a table and a chair and it will do for now. Anyway, here is what happened. Earlier, when I first found the cavern at the end of that long sloping tunnel, I had an idea. I pulled a strand of wool from the edge of the blanket and went back along the tunnel a little way. Then I carefully tied that strand of wool at about ankle level between two beams of the frames that shore up the passageway. I, felt, I figured if Walt or anyone else came close, they would trip and fall and that would alert me to their presence. I must have dozed off because a man's curse startled me awake. I opened my eyes to blackness and heat. It was darker than a wall of coal painted black. The darkest night you have ever seen was like noonday compared to it. And the heat. I could barely breathe for it. I was slick with sweat. For a terrible moment I thought I had died and gone to the fiery place. Then I smelled the whiskey, urine, and, al and alkali water, and I remembered where I was. I must have slept longer than I meant to, and my candle had burnt out. I reached into my medicine bag for a match and candle, but there was no need. I could now discern a faint yellow glow seeping into my little cavern. 
the light was increasing second by second. I deduced from this that someone was coming down the tunnel with a lantern. I edged around the wall of the cavern and tried to lift the pick as a weapon, but it was too heavy. So I took the hammer. It was pretty heavy too, but I reckoned I could manage. I scooted as close as I dared to the opening of my cavern. I backed up against the damp rock and prayed that the person with the light was someone who had come to rescue me. The marshal, or a miner, or maybe even Ping. The golden lamplight grew brighter and I could hear footsteps and someone chewing, even above the smell of al al Even above the smell of alkali water and urine, I could smell bay rum hair tonic. And then the barrel of a big Colt's Army revolver nosed through the opening like an evil creature poking out of its den. I couldn't see the owner, just the big gun. It was gripped in a man's left hand. That, and the, and the fact that it, had a, that it had a bone-handled grip, made me certain it was Whitlin Walt. As the hand with the Colt's Army revolver nosed its way into my cave, I lifted the heavy hammer back over my head, and then I brought it down as hard as I could on the man's wrist. The gun went off with a noise that nearly deafened me, and at the same time, the lamp fell and the light went out. When my ears stopped ringing, I could hear a man cursing in language unfit for publication. It was Walt, all right. I pulled a match from my medicine pouch and stuck it on the rock face. Its bright flare of yellow light showed Walt half crouched and holding his left wrist, the extinguished oil lamp rolling on its side and the Colt's Army revolver lying almost at my feet. I blew out the match and, although it was pitch black again, I lunged for the pistol. I heard Walt's voice only inches away, cursing richly. But I had his piece and I knew the layout of the cave. Holding the revolver in my right hand and using my fingertips on the rock face to guide me, I edged as far away from Walt as I could. Then I transferred the revolver to my left hand, found a match with my right and struck it. The light showed me my last candle on the whiskey crate. I lit it with a trembling hand and then quickly transferred the big pistol to my right hand. Dang you, that hurt, said Walt. He was holding his injured wrist. I have been through miles of this danged inferno, and I find you in the last place I look. You are slipperier, slipperier than a greased weasel. Plus, I think you broke my wrist. Do not move, or I will shoot off your kneecaps, I said, using both hands to train the revolver on him. What do you want? You know what I want he said. I want that letter. Well, you're not getting it, I said. You can go to hell. Pardon my French. Walt took a step toward me. I used both thumbs to pull back the stiff hammer of the big colt. Don't think I won't do it. Whoa, said Walt. He held up his good hand, palm forward. The damaged hand dangled uselessly. Don't do anything hasty. I saw his eyes dart around the cave like he was looking for a weapon or something to help him. Then he did something that surprised me. He smiled. In the dim light of a single candle I could not tell if it was a genuine smile or a fake smile. I like you, Pinky, he said through his grinning gritted teeth, and I don't want to hurt you. I said, if you don't want to hurt me, then why are you shooting at me? He shrugged and lowered his good hand a little. I was just firing off some warning shots, he said. If I really wanted to hit you, I could have. In fact, I have come down here to invite you to join the gang. He grinned and rubbed the back of his neck with his good hand. Rubbed the back of his neck. <coughs> you want me to join your gang? All you have to do is give me that there letter, he said between chomps. We will go up to the recorder's office together and present that letter and we will share the proceeds. And you can live with me in a big mansion up on A Street. 
by the end of the year, I'll have this town in my pocket. Why would you want me in your gang, I said. Walt chomped on his tobacco. Your ma was a Lakota squaw named Squats on a Stump. She dropped you behind a bush in a place called Hard Luck, not far from Mount Disappointment. Ain't that so? I stared at him. How did he know these things? Walt said, You think your pa was Robert Pinkerton, but he wasn't. The heavy revolver was making my arms ache, but I kept it trained on him. I said, Yes, he is. Robert Pinkerton is my pa. He gave me a button off his Pinkerton Railroad detective jacket, and he sent my ma that letter so we'd be rich. No, he didn't, said Walt. That letter is a clever forgery. I know because I wrote it myself. I lowered the revolver, but kept it cocked. What? I said. Me and your ma concocted this, that scheme together, said Walt. But then a band of Shoshone got her, and I've been looking for that letter for a long time. It's a good forgery. It'll fool any judge in the territory. But it was witnessed by my pa, Robert Pinkerton. <laughs> Walt laughed. Robert Pinkerton wasn't your pa, and that button isn't his. I won that button off a Pinkerton Railroad detective back in 52. I felt like someone had punched me in the gut. I said, What are you saying? Whitlin Walt smiled at me. I am saying that I am your paw. Ledger Sheet 44 I could not believe it. Whitlin Walt the most sadistic and hated desperado in the Comstock was claiming to be my father? It was so hot and stifling I couldn't breathe. I said, You're not my pa. My voice sounded feeble. Walt said, I lied to your ma. I told her I was Robert Pinkerton to impress her. And it worked. My heart was thumping. I thought I had detective blood flowing in my veins, but now it appeared it was desperado blood. You know that button you got? It came from a jacket I won in a poker game. He rubbed the back of his neck with his good hand and grinned. I remembered something Poker Face Jace had told me. One of the signs of an untruthful person is if they rub the back of their neck. Walt shook his head. If you give me that letter, he said, then that will prove I can trust you, and we can be partners. I remembered something else. Jace told me sometimes people shake their heads when they're saying yes, and sometimes they nod when they're saying no. Jace told me to believe a person's body, not his words. A gleam of hope burned in my heart. I lifted the Colt's Army revolver again so that it was pointed at his knee. Prove you're my pa, I said. Tell me what is my real name. What did my Indian ma call me? Walt grinned. In the flickering candlelight, it made him look evil. Your ma named you Glares from a Bush. When he said that, my knees kind of gave out, and I found I was sitting on the upturned bucket I'd been using as a chair. I felt sick. I saw some bright little spots, like gnats, swarming across my vision. Maybe I had read him wrong. Maybe he was telling the truth. But he'd rubbed his neck. He had shook his head no while meaning yes. And he had stopped chewing tobacco just like it when he was bluffing at poker. I had an idea. I looked up at him. You were there when I was born? I said. Of course I was, he said. I stayed with your ma a year or two. Then she went her way and I went mine. I always miss not being there to teach you to hunt and fish and shoot. No, I said. No, you are lying. You're not my pa. Here's what happened. You heard from someone that my ma had a valuable letter for my original pa. I'll bet that someone was Tommy Three. That is probably why he took up with ma. For riches, not love. I never did like him, and I will wager that letter is real. 
Otherwise, you could just forge another. Walt's smile faded and he swallowed hard. I said, they were on their way here. Maybe they were going to meet you. Or maybe only Tommy planned to meet you. But then there was an Indian raid and they died. You tracked me to Temperance and you killed my foster ma and pa and you ransacked the house, but you didn't find that letter. You followed me up here to Virginia and someone told you that I never knew my original pa, so you thought you would pretend to be him. It had to be someone. It had to be someone I told my Indian name. It wasn't Tommy Three because Ma never told him my Indian name, nor hers either. So the traitor must have been someone in Virginia City. I'll bet it was that fork-tongued liar Sam Clemens, wasn't it? Walt tried to smile, but even in the flickering candlelight, I could tell it was a fake. He said, I am your real Pa. Now give me that letter, son. I am not your son, I said. If you were really my pa, who had held me when I was born, then you would not have called me son. Well, why not? I said, because I'm not a boy. I'm a girl. Let's take that in for a minute. Ledger Sheet 45 Walt's jaw dropped open and he stared bug-eyed. It was the most extreme example of expression number four I had ever seen. He had the same expression as a man I once saw who was kicked by a mule. You're a girl? He said the last word as if it was something terrible. Yes, I said, lowering the pistol. I'm a girl. Walt said, that's impossible. Everybody knows you're a boy. Tommy Three told me you was. They told me down in Temperance, too. And even when you dressed up like a girl, you didn't look like one. My Indian ma knew I'd be safer if I pretended to be a boy. She was the one made me dress like this. But that suited me fine. And Ma Evangeline agreed it was a good idea. I took a step towards him. And you just admitted you know Tommy Three. So now I know you are a lying, no-good snake. He said, You ain't no girl, but you ain't like no boy I ever seen neither. You ain't white, and you ain't Indian. You know what you are? He had expression number three on his face, and he spat on the ground. You are a misfit. I looked at him and swallowed hard. I may be a misfit, I said, but I am also P.K. Pinkerton. And I know, and now I know what to do. I put down his heavy revolver and pulled the letter out of my medicine bag. Carefully and deliberately, I tore up the document giving the bearer the right to half of Virginia City and the layer of silver frosting beneath it. Then I let all the tiny pieces flutter down to my feet. No! yelled Walt, and then he did something I hadn't been expecting. He reached into his pocket with his good right hand and pulled out a gun. It was my own Smith & Wesson 7-shooter, and he was pointing it straight at me. This is what I was thinking. That Smith & Wesson 7-shooter can't hit me, but if I could wing him with his revolver, I would not be killing him. So I reached for the big bone-handled Colt. A gunshot rang out. At the, so at the same moment, I felt like someone had punched me hard, and I fell to the ground. Sam Clements had been wrong. Apparently, you could hit something with that Smith & Wesson 7-shooter. Whoa. And that's where we're going to leave off this episode, but next time, I'm sure you're going to want to find out what happens to PK. So until then... Be good.